Take your Bible if you would. Turn the microphone on before Michael gets to it. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I've preached this passage before a few times. I have it on video. I've taught it as the cycles of Christian growth. And sometimes ideas just jump out at me, literally out of nowhere. And uh, that's usually God's way of letting me know that it wasn't my idea to begin with, that it came from the Lord. But something, there's something about this passage. I've read it numerous times. I've preached on it several times. I've preached on it here. I know I've taught the cycles of Christian growth probably about three or four times here. I've gone to other churches. I'm, I know I taught it out in Kenya a few times, taught it to them. The idea that in our life as believers, since God created us, he recreated us, that my life in Christ will have cycles in it. There isn't anything in the creation that doesn't, if you think about it. Sun rises, sun sets, rain comes, drought comes, fall, winter, spring, summer. Um, the stars move around in a circle. Time goes around like this. And my life, I'll have ups and I'll have downs. And usually when I'm up, things are going so well that generally I don't need God anymore. Because things are going so well. And we don't pray like we should. We don't read the Bible like we should. We don't do things that we should. So God says, well, I can't have you like that. So I'm going to bring you back down. And he does. Hits us pretty hard sometimes. And we're down in the dumps. And we don't like being there. And there's sin all around us. And so we cry unto God. And God starts lifting us back up again. And there we are again. And I've taught that. There's many different examples in the Bible that'll show you that. But that's not how I'm going to preach this this morning. I'm going to preach this in relation to time. Now, that's something that I'm studying in the Bible. I want to understand time and I want to understand it for a reason. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why, but with me, it's usually I'm trying to figure something out about what's going to happen in the future, how it's going to happen, and so on. I'm usually trying to figure out the, the beast, the Antichrist, who he is. You know, he's, he's in our Bible, but he's not revealed yet. I, we don't know who he is. Well, that bugs me. If, I, if there's a mystery somewhere, I want to know what it is. If there's a secret, I want to find out the secret. That's just my nature. That's why, I guess that's what drives me. But I've been studying time in the Bible and how it works. And time is always cyclical or cyclical in nature. Always is. And you see that in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. God tells you that in almost no uncertain terms. Now I mentioned a while ago that I'm going to show you in this passage and in other things that somebody actually does know the future okay and if you say well god does you're right god always knows the future he knows your future he knows your past he knows how things are with you right now even when you try to hide things from people god knows how you really are and then god knows how you're going to turn out. God knows all of these things. And we're going to examine that from the scriptures in a little bit. But there's somebody else that knows it. Believe it or not. Somebody else knows the future. So, this, t this title of this message, Lindsay, write this down. Warnings from the future. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. I want you to notice what the Bible's telling you. 
One generation passeth away and another generation cometh. Now, is that true? And it's real simple, isn't it? It's true and it's simple. The earth abideth forever. By the way, does the earth spin? Does it go in cycles? I'm sure it does. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The sun came up this morning, just like the sun came up yesterday morning, just like it's going to come up tomorrow morning. The wind goeth toward the south, turneth about unto the north. And I can tell you, if you've ever lived in Oklahoma, you know how true that is. When I was going to Bible college in Oklahoma, it's usually just a, a flat area and all the trees lean to the north because the wind is constantly blowing in Oklahoma. And it's funny, you go out there, you know, here in Missouri, all trees standing straight up, but out there, they all lean in one direction because the wind is constantly blowing that direction. It's usually to the north. So the wind goeth toward the south, turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his what? So now he's telling you these things. And he actually used the word circuit, which means a circle. And what he's getting at, he's God is explaining how time works. How time works. He's explaining it to you. Now, again... I'm trying to study this and I'm trying to understand things that probably are way above my head. But I found that if it's knowledge I get from science, I may not understand it. But if it's knowledge I get from God, from the Bible, generally I understand it pretty well. I get it about as far as... As my mind can possibly understand something, I understand it. And then he says in verse 7, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. You ever think about that? Back when Solomon wrote this, it was 3,000 years ago when Solomon wrote this. And nobody at that time understood what we now know. We learned this in elementary school biology or we learned this in uh, science class that there is a water cycle. You're, he's shaking his head. You learned that in school, didn't you? So all the water runs into the ocean, right? And the ocean then, the water evaporates and goes up where? To the. Cl I'm not asking you, I'm asking him. Goes into the clouds, right? And then what do the clouds do? Who's answering it for me? My mom pointed at my sister. My sister pointed at my mom. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. Now, let me see if I can explain time the way God just did here, like a river. Everybody look up here for a second. We have a, an expression. We call it water under the bridge. What does that mean? It's over. Whatever happened, it's water under the bridge, right? Meaning that we've put it behind us and i want you to think about he's, what he said all the rivers run in the sea yet the sea is not full from the place that they started they turn around they come back again so think of a river think of the mississippi river over here or the merrimack river or the joachim or the whatever river the water that runs down the river is the past because once it no matter where you stand on the riverbank once the water goes down, it's gone. If you've ever dropped, dad always, dad worked on the river and dad always had a problem with his sunglasses falling into the Mississippi River. He would put his sunglasses in his shirt pocket the way God did back then 
And he worked on a big boat. And every time he leaned over the edge, sunglasses fall out into the river. Now, once they fell into the river, they're gone. And that's exactly the way time is. Once something happens, it's gone. It's over with. There's no getting it back. You don't make the rivers run backwards, do you? And yet, if you look up the river, up there, that's the future. Water that hasn't come our way yet is headed our direction. Now, who knows about the water that's coming our direction? The people who live up there. Who remembers the 93 flood? Never forget it, right? A combination of things happened. Number one, we got a lot of rain here. But... The biggest culprit in the 93 flood was Minnesota and Iowa. They were the two biggest culprits because they both got a ton of snow that year and then it turned warm fast. All that snow started melting and then, and I remember this, there was one thunderstorm after another moving through Iowa. Downtown Iowa almost flooded out. Now that was water that came our direction. Had we lived a hundred years ago without the news telling us, we wouldn't have known about it, would we? We wouldn't have known that in the future, a mass amount of water was coming down from Iowa and Minnesota and was going to flood out all of our farms, people's houses, people's storefronts. Back in 93, if you were not here in Festus in 93, the Mississippi River actually got up past First Baptist Church there on Main Street. All the way to that bank that's there. I don't remember what address it is, but it's on Main Street. All the way up to that bank. That's how, that's how bad it flooded. And here's my point. The people in Iowa could have told us, in fact, they did. They warned us that that water was coming our direction. You see what I'm saying here? Remember, downstream is the past. Up the river is the... And it hasn't happened yet. Does that make sense to everybody? So now, turn to verse 9. Look at verse 9. He's actually going to tell you how time works. Verse 9. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So verse 10. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see... This is new. What's the answer to that? No. It hath been already of old time, which was what? What's that next word? Before us. Meaning that it's already happened and it's going to happen again. Now I need to pray a little bit. You pray for me. I'm not really myself today, don't know why. Maybe I'm a little sick. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just, I don't know, I get this way every now and then. Not, not my best day today. So you pray for me that this message will make sense. I think it will. I think by the time I'm done, you might understand that somebody besides God actually knows the future. Okay? Father, I need your help today. More ways than one. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless this church, bless these people. Fill us with knowledge. Give us understanding. Father, I understand that maybe today it won't be a large amount of words 
that makes a difference. Maybe it'll just be a small amount of words. Maybe the less I say today would be better. But Father, teach, teach everybody what you told me. I understood it, Father. When you said it to me, I understood it. I got it. And I realized that that is exactly what you just said here. And I never saw that before. I've read this, I've preached it, Father. You, maybe you just had a time that I needed to learn it. So maybe somebody today who's listening to this, maybe they won't get it today. Maybe it won't be time for them. But maybe one day, God, you'll cause them to remember it or you'll speak it to them and they'll know it because then it'll be time for them. There's a time and a season for everything. Father, teach us to understand this. Bless the older generation that dies off and bless the new generation that is born. Bless them both with this message, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Give me a, give me a second, Journey. That's why I don't want to shake your hand this morning, all right? Now, time. Who knows the future? Well, take a look at this. This is what got me thinking about it. Does anybody know who this is? It's some people I know who are two-faced. <laughs> it's actually this Thursday, Thursday night, January 31st. Okay? And then Friday will be January, or, yeah, December 31st, this Thursday. And then Friday is going to be January 1st, right? Did I, get, did I say it right? Okay. And you know, on the news... They always do this on the news. Right about this time of year, they always say, let's go back and recap the year in the news. I don't want to hear any more about 2020. I don't want to hear it. But they never say on the news, now, let's show you what is going to happen in 2021. Unless they're going to say, Joe Biden's going to be the president. That was a joke. The, the name, the word January actually comes from a mythical god named Janus. J-A-N-U-S. And, Jan, and the reason why they call the month January and the reason why it's the new year is that Janus is a two-faced god. Now, which is it? That's interesting to me. Because the Bible says that a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. So if, if you were somebody back a thousand years ago and you worshipped Janus, you worshipped a God that was nuts out of his mind. He's unstable. But Janus is looking two different directions. Janus looks to the past. He's the God of history. And Janus looks to the future. He's the God of prophecy or the God of the future. That's why he's two-faced and they're facing opposite directions. Now, I don't worship that God. Don't care nothing about it. I just thought I'd throw that in. This is why we have January at the beginning of the year and why everybody says, let's all look back at the past and let's hope for a better year. That's why everybody does that. But who knows the future? What if... What if somebody showed up, Jim, in your driveway one morning, you're fixing to pull out and go to work. And a guy walks up to you, he's kind of got funny clothes. And he comes to you and you're fixing to get in the car and he says, Jim, I know you don't know me, but don't pull out yet. And you're going to go, why not? Who are you? And the guy's going to say, I'm from the future. And you're going to go, oh my goodness. And you're probably reaching for your phone trying to text your wife to have her call 911. But he says, trust me, 
All I want you to do is count to 10 before you pull out of the driveway. And I'm out of here. So he leaves, disappears. Count to 10. You pull out of your driveway. An accident just happened at the corner. Would have killed you. And you would be going, he was from the future. Right? If somebody would have come back from the future and told us, don't let anybody from China come to this country because they're going to be bringing a disease into this country and it's going to kill a bunch of people and it's going to destroy this whole nation. Maybe we should have listened to him. Or if somebody would have warned the whole country that some people were going to cheat and steal the election, maybe we would have done something about it. Don't you wish that you would have known then what you know now? I would have been standing outside those polling places with my AR-15 going, excuse me, you're not taking that box in this building, I guarantee you that. Now think about what I just said. It's impossible. It's silly to think that somebody can go from the future and travel in the past and tell you what's going to happen. But we know that God knows everything that's going to happen, don't we? Revelation 1.8. Here's what Jesus said. I am Alpha and Omega. What does that mean? I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Listen to how Jesus tells you about... He, in fact, He's describing time for you. The three parts of time are past present and future. And look what he says here. I am the Lord, which is right now. And aren't you glad that Jesus is right here, right now? Somebody say amen. I know I am. But then he was, meaning that if you read in Genesis 7, that God destroyed the entire earth with a flood, I trust the guy who was there who saw it. His name was Jesus. So I trust the stories out of my Bible. I believe every one of them's true, don't you? You weren't there. We don't have a time machine to go back, even though I've fantasized that one. From all those science fiction books and movies that I watched. and read. Hey, there we go. There's my sci-fi guy right there. Go back in a time machine and actually watch the flood or watch Jesus being crucified or watch this or watch that. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But I have somebody who was already there that I know he was there and I trust what he says. Amen? Then he says in verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia and Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. He wants the letters written to these churches and he wants them to know that I've already seen everything in the past and I've already seen everything in the future. And oh, guess what? And he makes this known to all seven of those churches. I know thy works. Now, how did Jesus know their works? He saw them. I could look at you this morning. I could look you right in the eye and make you think I know something about you, but I don't. But is there something that you're hiding from everybody in the world that you don't want anybody to know about it? Something you did in your past. Everybody does. Everybody does. But who knows about it? Jesus. He was there. He saw you. David had Uriah killed to cover up a pregnancy. And when Uriah was killed, he married the woman that he got pregnant to make it look like it was 
legitimate birth. And he thought nobody knew about it. But God did. God knew everything he did. Him trying to hide. If anybody can cover up something, a man in power like a king, he can have it covered up. And he had Uriah that killed so that Uriah couldn't come and say, I was gone. That ain't my kid. Whose kid is it? Everybody in this room's got skeletons in their closet they don't want anybody to know about. Jesus knows about them because he was there. Because he was. He is right now. And by the way, he will be. And he knows what's going to happen with you. Revelation 21, 6. He said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 22, 13. I am Alpha and Omega. How many times does he say that now? You know what the number four represents? It represents multiple things in the Bible. And one of the things it represents is time. Isn't that interesting? That four times, four times Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. And he's talking about time. Meaning he knows everything that has happened and he knows everything that will happen. So let's go back to this guy, Jim, that showed up in your driveway and told you to wait 10 seconds before you drove out. Was he right? So you're going, he's from the future. If he showed up again and told you like a week later and said, you're planning on going over here for lunch. Don't go over there for lunch. So you go, hmm. Well, you find out that that place you were going for lunch, everybody in there got sick food poisoning. So now you're going, that guy knows he's from the future. Either that or he's playing some kind of trick with you. But do we know that Jesus actually is from the future? He said he was. He said, I am he that is and was and is to come. Meaning, he knows everything that's already going to happen to you, doesn't he? So let me give you something real easy to think about. Did Jesus know that you were headed to hell? Did he know that you were headed to hell? Did he warn you? Did you believe him? See how it works? He knows the future and he knows that you were bound for hell and he came to stop you from going to hell. Meaning he told you where your future was headed and he came to intervene in your life to save you from that. Thank God there is a God who knows the future. Somebody say amen. Now, look at Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Matthew 24, turn there. Matthew 24 is a revelation of things that haven't happened yet or are happening now, but are going to happen in the future. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, do we believe that? Should we not be watching for that? Should we not listen to the warning that our Bible is giving us? And I, I mentioned something a while ago about the news telling you about, you know, all the things that happened in the past. And I said, they don't really tell you what's going to happen in the future. But I was actually wrong about that. Because if you go over here to Walmart or to Schnucks to the checkout line, there's a magazine there, a tabloid, right Gary? That has 50 prophecies from the world's best astrologers. I've always wanted to get a copy of that, hang on to it for a year, and go, ah, they were wrong there, they were wrong there. They... I don't recall any of them. 
back in December telling us there's going to be a deadly disease to go throughout our country. I don't remember that. Do they always get that stuff wrong? In fact, what if they're right about 49 of them, but they're wrong about one? According to God, we don't have to listen to them at all. They're not from God. Do you know Gene Dixon, who wrote your horoscope back in the 70s and 80s? They claimed that she had a 90% success rate. And she actually claimed that she got her prophecies from God. She lied. All of these things in Matthew 24 that Jesus told us to watch out. Verse 7, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. They shall take you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And all these things here. And then he said, verse 13, he that shall endure unto the end, the same that shall, shall be saved. And here's what I know. God already knows who's going to endure and who's not. God knows the future. Now, in the movie, Back to the Future, the second one, remember that one? And see, this, this is what I want. I want a book with all the sports scores on it to go back into the past so I could win bets. Right? Do we have a book from the future? Sure we do. Isaiah 30 verse 8. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Psalm 119. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Isaiah 46. I turn to Isaiah 46 and underline this in your Bible. I'm trying to move on a little bit. Trying to hurry a little bit. I don't feel very good today. That clock already says 25 after 12, but I think that clock's wrong. Is that clock? Please tell me that clock's wrong. Okay. So I'm not doing too bad so far. Isaiah 46, 10. No, notice what, notice, underline this in your Bible. Declaring the end from the beginning. You have in your hands a book that declares not just the world's future but yours personally and I mentioned a while ago when God told you that you're headed for hell you listened to him and you accepted Jesus and you were saved to avoid going to hell However, why didn't you listen to his other warnings? The other warnings that said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That was a warning. Because God said, If you do that, ye shall die. You remember Achan from the Bible? The man Achan, Joshua told the Israelites, when you go into Jericho, don't touch any of their gold, their silver, their stuff. Don't touch any of it. It's defiled. Leave it there. Did Achan hear that? Yes. Why didn't he heed the warning? He did what God told him not to do. And him and his whole family had to die as a result of it. So, one of the things I'm going to tell you is, there are more than one warning in the Bible about what would happen if you did such and such thing. Why didn't you listen to those? There's things that God tells us in His Word even after we're saved. He tells us, do these things. And if you will, I'll bless you. If you don't do these things, 
then I'm going to take a rod after you. Why don't we do those? Why don't we heed those warnings as well? Why is it that it seems like we always have to make God use a rod against us before we'll believe what he says? Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. If we think that God said something in his word that he isn't really going to do, then you don't believe the Bible the way you're supposed to believe the Bible. Because the Bible is a book that comes from the future. And it tells us everything that's going to happen. And everything that could happen if we don't heed the warnings of the Bible. And yet, way too many times, we don't heed the warnings of the Bible. 2 Peter 1.19, we have also a more... I haven't got to the, the biggest part of the message yet, so don't lose me just yet. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Where until you do well that you take heed. As, see, he's telling you. The Bible already knows the future. You will do well if you take heed to what the Bible's telling you. Which is better? To hear what God said, disobey what God said, get a beating from God, or, and say, well, I learned from my mistake, or... Listen to what God said and don't do what God told you not to do. Which is better? To obey or to get a beating? To obey. That's what Samuel told to uh, Saul. Saul rebellions is sin and witchcraft. To obey is better than sacrifice. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go back to the river analogy. So, we're here in Missouri. The people up in Iowa know that there is a huge amount of of water that has fallen on them they're up river they're from the future and they notify us down here in Missouri that there is a large amount of water coming you need to prepare for it because there's nothing that's going to stop it I want you to think about that analogy and go back to Ecclesiastes I want you to notice in Ecclesiastes 1 and I don't have this on the screen I want you to look at it in verse 4 and the whole point of this message I want all the young people to listen to me all the teenagers, all the kids, I want you to listen to me, okay? Listen to your preacher, listen to your grandpa, listen to your dad. Notice he starts this whole thing out by saying, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh. And in this, he's talking about time and how time goes in cycles. Okay, my grandfather lived his time, brought forth my father, my father lived his time, brought me into the world, I'm living my time, and I have brought my children into the world, they in turn are bringing their children into the world. And I want you to think about now, who is it out of all of these people that knows the future? Because he says, 
Verse 9, the thing that hath been is that, that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. When my dad tried to teach me things, I didn't listen. I didn't listen. You know why I didn't listen? Because I was 16. And 16-year-old boys, it's scientific fact that all 16-year-old boys and girls are smarter than 40-year-old people. Scientific proven fact. And I want you to think about your dad and your grandpa's life. According to Ecclesiastes, was there anything that happened in their lifetime? Or was there, let me put it like this. Is there anything in your life right now that never happened during their life? No. There is no new thing. Or you say, well, we got electronics now. So what? Electronics aren't evil. It's what we do on them and with them that's evil. So, have you ever lied electronically? Yes. Did you know they didn't need electronics in your grandpa's day to lie? Do people steal with electronics? Yes. Did people steal in your grandpa's day? Do people commit adultery with electronics? They were doing that for a thousand years ago. So, when you get down to it, is there anything happening in any of these young people's lives that hasn't already happened to their forefathers? No. You know, if you read the founding fathers, if you read John Adams, George Washington, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. If you read these guys, do you know what they warned us about writing that constitution? They warned us about Joe Biden. They wrote into the constitution, Milton, laws that were supposed to prevent foreign influence in an election. That's why they put those, they did that 200 years ago. They put those laws in there. You know why? Because they knew then that other nations would try to influence the goings-on in the government of the United States. They tried, they, listen, they were from the future. They tried to warn us. You know why? Because they already saw it. I told my son this the other day. I said, you're going to do this. Dad, you don't know that. I said, yeah, I'm from the future. I'm from the future. I know exactly what you're going to do. Because I'm from the future. I've already seen it. And I want you to think about that. My generation has already seen the outcome of my children's lives, haven't I? Haven't I? Do you think I ever rebelled against God? Do you think I ever did things I told you kids not to do? Do you think I ever suffered the shame, the punishment, the guilt, the torment? Of sin? You think I ever went through that? Yep. Which is why I came from the future to tell my children not to do certain things. Or that they should do certain things. I lived in the future. I live, I've already lived your life. 
And I've already seen the outcome of what happens when you do certain things. And I'm telling you, you won't like it. Doesn't, and I don't have this in my notes, but doesn't, in the book, in fact, it's in Colossians. Turn in Colossians. Let's see if we can find it. You see if you can find it before I do, if you know what I'm talking about. Did not Paul tell the older people in the church to teach the young people in the church how to live? Or where is that? If you find it, let me know. The older, the elder women. Teach the younger women how to be keepers at home, how to be chaste. Where is that, Pam? Ephesians 5. I'll, I'll take that. What verse? Anyway, yes, Donna. Titus. I said Colossians. I so I was right. Titus. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Titus chapter 2. Verse 2. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Look at verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Do you think older women know what life is all about? We used to have two godly women in this church. And they tried to pass on a little wisdom to me and younger generations of people in this church. And now they're gone. So now it falls on. See all these kids here? Look at all these kids. Aren't they something? Do we, as older people, not know where they're headed if they don't give heed to the warnings of God from the future? Which is why you ought to bring your kids to Sunday school. Sunday morning. Sunday night, Wednesday night. Mom, where were we on Wednesday night? Where were we on Sunday night when everybody was home watching The Wonderful World at Disney? Because it came on at 6 o'clock and our church came in on at 6 o'clock. And I acted sick one night so I could watch Disney and wouldn't have to go to church. Got away with it once. But you know, Disney never really has helped me in my life. Amen? She wasn't wrong making sure her kids were in God's house. Because she didn't have a mom and daddy to take her there. And she said, my kids are going to be different. They're going to know what the Word of God says. Because she wanted us to live a little bit better life than she lived. Am I right? And I didn't realize it, but she was from the future. Because she already lived my childhood. And she already lived my teenage years. She even tried to warn me as an adult of things that I shouldn't get into. Because she would already knew where it was going and she tried to warn me. And I didn't listen. 
I'm telling you, young people, which is anybody younger than me, I've made mistakes. I've done things that God told me not to do. I've been burned. I am from your future. I already see the path you're on and the direction you're going. And I am doing everything I can to tell you, don't go down there. I mentioned this Sunday night, preaching down at Ron's. There was, I knew there was people in that church, Matthew, that they had stuck with the King James all their life. Because they were amen and me like crazy. And I told them, I said, I can tell some of you people, once you got saved, you got a King James in your hand, you never left that book. Never, never. And I've had people write us and tell us, that, Brother Mike, I've used the King James now for 60 years. I ain't never used another Bible in my life. Praise the Lord! But for some reason, God wanted me to mess that up. Or maybe I just didn't listen when I should have. And I went down the road. And by God's grace, He let me see the big accident that was waiting down the road. He told me not to go down because He's from the future, right, Jim? He's from the future. And He told me not to go down that road. But I went down there anyway. And God let me come back. And, and I told Him Sunday night, this, this is coming out today. I told him, I said, I'm standing here at the edge of that road. I'm from the future. I've been down there. I'm telling you, don't go down that road. You won't like it. It is the responsibility of every one of us adults to help show the younger generation, please don't make the mistakes that we made. Matthew, didn't your Uncle Steve try to tell you that? Because Matthew plays that guitar and he plays it pretty good. And him and Uncle Steve got pretty close because Uncle Steve played that guitar pretty good. And I don't know, but I'm pretty sure Steve may have told Matthew, Matthew, don't ever play in a bar. Matthew, don't ever play in a bar. Because that's what got Steve in trouble. He was from the future, Matthew. And he told you, I'm telling you, I'm from the future. Don't go down there. Because he suffered for it. All his life he suffered with the consequences of his sin. And if he were standing here today, he would tell you, don't do what I did. Amen? Young people, listen to your parents and respect your elders, especially in this church. Respect the elders in this church, young people. They're trying to save your life. Your mom and dad, when they tell you, you can't go down to so-and-so's house, do you know why they're telling you that? They're telling you that to save your life. Because they're from the future. They've already been down there. They know what's going to happen to you when you start running around with so-and-so. Now you may get to be in an age to where you don't care anymore and you're not going to listen anymore. I hope that God gives you the grace to be able to come back. Did the prodigal son, was he not warned? Did he not know? But he did it anyway. You may not ever come back. Amen? So who knows the future? We do. Don't we, Milton? And you try to tell these boys, boys, don't run with them guys. Don't listen to that music. Don't hang out over here at this guy's house. Why you tell them that, Milton? She you love them. You love them. You don't want them to make the mistakes that you know they're going to make. Amen?